that is the goal of the production octopus. We want happy customers and we want profitable jobs. And then we want those profitable jobs to also get us more leads, get more leads just for doing your job and ultimately improve the fulfillment ability of the business at every level in the long term so you don't end up with a funnel that looks like this. Tool process adoption. Production Octopus. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. I want to help you guys understand this. So the core fundamentals are we are designing an org chart for your production department, which was going to start with production management. This role focuses on the supplier relationships and managing of the production octopus. All right. So these people are ultimately the masters of the production department. Then we have the field manager. They are the eyes out in the field. They're responsible for overseeing production on site, coordinating with site supervisors and managing customer interactions. I'm going to literally draw you a picture to make this simple. But before we get into the, the what, we're going to have to understand the why and the how. And so the final one is the site supervisors. These are the energetic young lads and ladies who act as the hands of the operation. And so I want to talk a little bit about, about roofing right? Safety is one part of roofing that is hard to manage. Roofers typically don't, like the roofers, the installers, typically don't take their own safety too seriously. We have to produce jobs with subcontractors who are paid by the square or by the bundle. So to them, speed equals profit, right? However, OSHA or OHNS in Canada expects, expects us to keep these contractors safe, but their whole thing is that they don't want to be safe because safe means slow. And so we try and solve that problem by making them sign subcontractor agreements where they are supposed to take responsibility so that we can ensure that they have their, like we can also make sure they have workers' compensation. And so that's in place. And that's supposed to try and take care of work to worker safety. And that way, if they get injured, we can enforce their need for fall protection training, right? And we can make them have to show up and say they have fall protection training from a third party. We can force them to do a site-specific safety plan and identify the hazards that exist on site and the consequences of ignoring them. We can even make them required to take photos that they documented that they put the fall arrest on the roof. And yet, in the middle of the day, we all know what happens. Roofers come off the roof, they go for lunch, and they drive to the convenience store to pick up their textbook gas station pizza, Jolly Rancher candies, and two monsters. And then they drive back to the site, step right over their fall arrest right here, and then they climb back up on the roof, and they get to work, and then all of a sudden, there's an OSHA cop on site, and Buddy's going, I wonder what that guy in the white Ford Explorer wants. And that OSHA guy actually has the audacity to manufacture this idea that we were like standing on the edge of the site, like Andrew Carnegie being like, mush you dogs, get back to work. You know, like, like cause we have a boat to buy, you know? And, and I don't think that, uh, I don't think that that's the case, but they actually believe it. And then they will charge us as if that's the case. And, and this isn't about safety, right? It's about this session is about production. Right? It's about getting roofs done properly, but it shows how hard running a roof site can be to manage is even when it comes to protecting their own lives and contractually making them do it and putting all these things in place to make sure they do it, they will still have a pizza and completely forget every single day. And they're the ones who would die. So how much do you think they really care about nail placement when they don't even care about their own lives? Okay, Their aversion to risk is huge, yet we want happy customers and we want profitable jobs. And then we want those profitable jobs to also get us more leads. And that is the goal of the production octopus, is that you get more leads just for doing your job and ultimately improve the fulfillment ability of the business at every level in the long term so you don't end up with a funnel that looks like this, where you have lots of leads and lots of sales, but no crews. So if you have that problem, you have to do something about it. And so... We're going to be working on how do we create a balanced funnel, and this is going to help you work to that end. And of course, the dream is that by doing so, you're going to have this endless stream of Google reviews coming in for your, from, for your business. 
because like this is the one thing I notice about our most successful customers is that they actually are intentional and look at their business as a two-sided funnel. So they don't just think about leads and sold jobs coming out the other end. They also think about how many of the sold jobs they build, how many of the builds actually get a review, how many get a testimonial, and how many get a referral or repeat business because reviews lead to more leads. Testimonials help us get better leads. Referrals actually turn into marketing qualified leads because they actually said, this is my friend Jimmy, and they want a roof. And repeat by a business is automatically a sales qualified lead. And if you don't know what this is, this is the roofing data model. And if you aren't tracking these numbers, you can't grow your business at the rate that you could if you were. And so we actually have a course about this. So let's, we like to call this strategy of fixing all these problems that we just talked about the production octopus. And I want to be clear, I have introduced this to plenty of roofers. So I'll, I'll give you your first objection so that we can work through it together so that you don't think that you're the first time you, that anybody's thought of this. All right. Because a lot of times people think that they can't afford this. When they see it the first time, and I'm talking about it, their brains start to shut off before I'm even done explaining it because they think they can't afford it because they don't understand it. And even after I'm done explaining it, this one time I was at this roofing company, um, they argued even then they couldn't afford it. Yet while I was there, over the course of the next few days, I heard about how one on one job site, they had some crew throw skylights off the side of the roof onto the grass where the skylights exploded into a zillion little pieces right on the grass, right? And they had to send people back multiple times to go pick up the shards of glass off the grass. And then I watched him argue arm wrestle with a shingle manufacturer because of the timing that their warranty documents were changed because they changed the documents to say that it was okay to have some gap between the boards because the customer saw that they roofed over top of the boards and that might mean their warranty is void. And so he was trying to argue over the timing of that. But when he showed me the company cam pictures from inside the attic, there was like one inch gaps, broken boards, like those circular knots in some of the boards that were kind of busted out, nails going through it and all kinds of garbage. It was totally obvious. And then another day, there was a customer who caught the installers months later, having not taken the backing off the peel and stick and just stapling it to the roof. So they didn't pull it off. And the funny thing is, this wasn't even the first time he'd heard of it. This actually happened on several jobs over the last year. And of course, by now, they got rid of the crew. But this customer was really upset about it. And now that one thing was wrong, everything was wrong. And this business owner was now in a place where he was trying to figure out how to get out of all these problems with his shirt on. And he ultimately had to replace the entire roof because the customer was upset. And... It wasn't just some rogue crew that did something wrong once. That's the excuse that most contractors will tell themselves when something like this happens, that it's some rogue crew that did something bad to them. And I want to give you a news flash. That isn't the truth. Here's the facts. Two of these things that uh, are things that would not would not get caught in a post-install check. So this was not like something that you could have caught doing a quality control check after the fact. So Put a three in the chat if you guys do a post-install quality control. If you think after the job, you send somebody to go check it. I'm just curious, like, what's the barometer of the room? You go back. So put a three in there if after the job, you go check it for quality. Because two of these things you wouldn't have caught unless you were looking for them. Because most of you don't go in the attic on a post-install check. And most of you don't go and check. How do you check the underlayment to see if the backing was pulled off? You have to literally, like, try and peel back shingles and look at the edge and get like look under the the rake of the roof and try and see that the ice and water still has the backing on it still right like it would be very hard to catch that and you would want to be looking for it to catch it and so the other thing is like the glass yeah you, you would have caught the glass but it was too little too late at this point and so we want to make sure that we have quality assurance not quality or we want to have quality control, not quality assurance. Quality assurance is assuring that the job is done to a quality level. Um, quality control is actually putting measures in place to control quality as it's happening. All of these examples were 100 were 100% preventable 
with the production octopus model and together the costs that have been incurred by those damages for that one client would pay for all the expenses of this model for six months by itself. And that's just the losses, right? And I don't mean that this is something that you should pay for just from theoretical prevention of losses. That's just a side benefit. The real benefit is what you can achieve when it comes to leads and what you can achieve when it comes to growth and customer experience, right? But um, what I want to talk about now is I want to do a demo, all right? So I'm going to share this to my iPad and I'm going to actually draw this out for you guys. Who's excited to learn more? Who has questions so far? Remember, Q&A box. You guys promised. All right. Let's see if this works. There we go. You guys see that? I love coloring. My intention is to stay silent. You guys see that? So that was my intention to actually make it through the 30 seconds because that, that 30 seconds of silence, man, I tell you, it's awkward. It's hard to do. Harder than you might think. So talking about the production octopus, what that is, is it's actually an octopus. So I like to draw it. So that's our octopus, right? And now at the head of every octopus, what do we have? We're going to have a brain, right? And then we're also going to have our eyes. And then we're going to have our hands. Now, this is just a visualization of an org chart. It makes it easy to remember. And that at the top, you have our production manager, right? We're going to call PM. And then we have a field manager. And then we have site supervisors, all right? And so this is just a visualization of an org chart in a way that's easy to remember. And I'm going to show you ratios to all of this. And these are the site supervisors. So you guys probably know what a production manager is. Um, who here has a production manager in their business? Because I could have zero, I could have like $1 million guys, $20 million guys, $5 million guys, girls, right? I don't know who I got in the room. So just in the chat, let me know. Uh, yes, if you have a production manager, no, if you don't. So I know how much, how deep I got to go and explain this position. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, perfect. Everybody, yes, everybody has, oh, one person, Kate, no problem. So production manager, their job is to play Tetris, okay? All right, and so if you remember Tetris, what it was like is you had these random blocks, right? And you'd have all these different types of random shapes. So ever had a sales guy sell a fence or some stupid shit he wasn't supposed to sell? That's this shape, remember that shape? Never went anywhere properly, right? And so you're gonna have these little random shapes and your job as a production manager is to say, okay, I've got, you know, I usually say 10 crews, but you know, whatever. Like you've got eight crews, right? And your job is to fill those boxes, right? Because that is Monday, okay? And your job every day is to make sure that that goes there and that goes there and this there and that goes freaking somewhere. And then we get mad at the sales guy because I know the insurance claim included damage to the fence, but we didn't really have to go and sell a fence because now we have to try and figure out how to hire a fence contractor and we just don't want to do any more fences. But sometimes these sales guys do that to us, right? So your job is to ultimately fill up the boxes and make sure that this every day is full. So that's the production manager's job is to play Tetris. So that's going to include vendor relations. Okay, it's going to include suppliers. It's going to require crew coordination, customer coordination, right? So they're basically coordinating everything to set it up on a calendar. And essentially the bottom row, right? And remember the bottom row. The bottom row, just like in Tetris, you want to lightning bolt that every day and make it go away because he optimized it. Now, if you're constantly looking at the blocks, right? If you're constantly living in this area, right? which is where the PM focus is. Then we have the field manager. The field manager's job, right? So this is the field manager's job. His job is to lightning bolt this stuff every day. His job is to make sure that this whole row goes as planned. Because this guy up here is trying to make sure crew, vendor, supplier, customer coordination. He's trying to make sure everything is going on, making sure material is going to get delivered on time, making sure that customers know when they're coming to install stuff. 
the production manager can't also be taking care of the day to day. They can't keep their eye on that stuff. They can eventually. Anybody who's doing it themselves knows that eventually they run out of bandwidth because you can't both call a customer back and go pick up an effing gooseneck at 4.45 p.m. on an effing Friday because the damn installers couldn't just count and see that we have three six-inch goosenecks and we have two goosenecks on site that, need, that can go on. We're missing one and we can't just call the production manager at three o'clock or noon or eight in the morning. No, it's gotta be at 4.45 p.m. on a Friday. I know because I used to do that life in my roofing company and drove me batty. So a good process helps, but as you grow, you can't just count on people being better. You have to put systems in place to prevent it. That's what the field manager does. Now, if you want to truly win at roofing, you want to have it so each one of these blocks, let's call this one a big block, okay? Each one of these blocks is supervised, and that's where you get a site supervisor, right? So going back up here, right, you have your PM, your field manager, and then you have your site supervisors. And the site supervisor's role, right, so if the field manager's job is to just zap this, right, well, these guys are zapping it independently. So why do we need this guy? All right. Well, the site supervisor's job is to act as a customer communicator, right? And their job is also to have flawless sites. Now, remember, they're a site supervisor. You are not going to get a 22-year roofer to do this job. Okay, They're not going to do it. And if they did, they would be too expensive. They're supposed to run a flawless job site. Okay. So when we look at a job site, we're going to draw a little house today. We have a job site. I know it's an ugly house. You try and do it live. Okay. Not every house is the same, right? So they want to make sure that we have somebody who shows up to the site and helps get set up properly. So they're going to do stuff like put the tarps out, right? Maybe they're going to set up the catch all. They're going to help knock on the customer's door and let them know that we're here, right? And they're gonna essentially make sure this job site goes well. If there's a critical install point, like a chimney or something like that, brick chimney, if there's something that the, 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 that was important about this particular area right here, you know, maybe they'll come up there and they're gonna make sure that the pictures get taken through all day, but they're gonna be the one that essentially makes sure this site is run well. And that way, the field manager knows that safety was being worn so they know that the safety stuff got taken care of right because you got to take care of that stuff nowadays they're going to make sure that we did have our property protection in place because again remember to roofers speed equals profit so safety does not equal speed properly flashing the chimney does not equal speed putting good tarps out making sure they stay in place not good not not profit same thing with your catch-all, not profit. So their job is to make sure that, that site looks great for when a customer drives by. And so they're not roofing experts, right? But they're going to make sure the place remains clean. And how they set up is you set up a little tent. And this one's kind of a big tent. And so we'll use Roofing USA as an example because that's where, where Bettina came from. So we'll go R-U-S-A. There's a little tent. And then we have a little table, R-U-S-A. And so their job is to be on site all day and manage this whole thing. But then they're also going to do something else that's special. They're going to have a little magnet rake, for example. Okay. And his job is to go around the site and do the magnet raking. But what happens when Mary drives by, right? And she's got her kids in the back and she's about to drive past the house to go to her house. Well, this guy wants to come and magnet rake in front of her and wave and be like, oh, hey, one sec, and wave a magnet rake out in front of the street and then let her go proceed to go home. And then he is going to be watching her at her house. And when she gets out and goes in her house and she's got her kids in, and she's not going to be bothered anymore. He's going to walk his little ass over there and he's going to talk to the customer <clears throat> and he's going to say, Hi, my name is Timmy. I'm just here with Roofing USA. We're just watching this job site right now. I'm sure you heard the noise and everything like that. Um, I just want to let you know if there's anything about that's bothering you or anything that is an issue, you know, just give me a call. Here's my card. Um, by the way, um, 
those folks there, uh, their roof was getting a little old and they started having leaks. So, have you had your roof checked? And the customer's going, no, we haven't actually. Well, hey, I'm not a salesman, but if you'd like to get your roof checked, I have this QR code on my badge here. You can scan it and someone will come and check the roof for free just because we love working with the neighbors of our current customers, right? And uh, she's going to say yes, no, or maybe. And then they're going to go through, you know, a little bit of maybe conversation. And hopefully that customer is going to choose to book an appointment. And for this guy is going to make some green, right? The whole idea is that's how this guy or girl makes their money. So again, going back to their list of duties, it's clean job sites, customer communication, right? Flawless. Also going to take pictures, right? To make sure that all the company cam stuff done, done. They're going to do the material delivery checklist. They're going to do the sub crew pay app sheet. So this is where the sub crew confirms that yes, we did 35 bundles up here. We did this much drip edge. We did one chimney and we did, uh, let's see, uh, we did, uh, let's say two vents, right? Or 100 feet ridge vent or something. Whatever the crew says they did, they're going to collect that in the sub crew pay app sheet. So in the back end, we're going to get a calculation that says, yep, they should be invoicing us for $2,300. When we do the material delivery checklist, we know that the stuff that we ordered showed up and we don't have to fight roofers anymore to take pictures of our job sites because that's what this guy does. But the bonus is that they're going to get referrals and neighbors. So those people that walk up and ask questions, they're gonna get those people. They're gonna get those people, right? They're gonna get the neighbors that they knock and that's what they're gonna do all day. Now, where we get everybody confused is, well, how am I gonna afford that? Because this guy's supposed to be there all day, talk to customers, make sure the site's nice and clean, being run flawlessly, he's gonna take pictures, He's going to make sure the material got delivered. He's going to do the subcrew pay up sheet. He's going to do the referrals neighbors. And he's also going to do an inspection. Oh, one sec. He's also going to do the inspection throughout the day so we get quality control. So the quality is then controlled because we're actually checking things throughout the day. He can't put it together, but he can he's been trained to do if it's right or wrong. And so the field manager's job is to train the site supervisors and provide them with the support. So if he's up here and doesn't know how that particular chimney is supposed to be flashed, he can get on FaceTime and he can make a phone call, right? Sorry, I'm writing a little fast, but he can get on FaceTime, use that video call to understand what that looks like. And now you're probably wondering where we're at. So when I go watch something on YouTube, and I want to learn something. I watch, you know, Alex Hermosi, Value Tainment, Winning by Design, Lex Friedman. I listen to a lot of stuff and, and try and learn a lot of things, even books, right? And I just wish that I could, like, excuse me, I just have a question. What did that word mean? <laughs> and But you can't do that. And in this environment, you can.